This is a seven English podcast and you're listening to Advent of the Archmage. Chapter 591, First Challenge in the Tundra. Link stood on the snowy peak and asked the sword spirit, Is this direction right? An icy wind blew around him while the boundless icy plain was before him. The air was abnormally clean. Looking down from the peak with his excellent vision, Link could see hundreds of miles. All of this land was the same tundra. What was different was that in the distance, it became darker. It was nighttime at the end. There was a clear difference between night and day in different parts of the north and south. This was a sight unique to the extreme north. The general direction is right, but too much time has passed. I don't know if the land has changed. The sword spirit's voice was full of uncertainty. The storm lord was from the ancient times and millenniums had passed. This was enough time for seas to turn into land. Link had no choice but to continue searching in the general direction. Whether or not he could find the peace of the so-called Book of Creation depended on his luck. I'll search for three months at most. If there aren't any clues after three months, I'll give up. Link set a deadline for himself. He still had many things to do and couldn't waste too much time on this. Pulling his clothes tighter, Link said to the other three, All right, let's continue. The three nodded. Nana took the lead and jumped down from the mountaintop. Then she ran down the slope. She looked as light as a floating leaf with perfect control of her strength. She couldn't do this before. In the past, Nana had perfect battle experience, but her fighting style depended on extreme speed and strength. If anyone could deal with those two, she would be in trouble. Now, she was in a whole new state. Her techniques mixed with her perfect experience, and she had indescribable agility. This was the subtle effect of the Water of Miracles. Iliard and Milos both cast flight spells to descend from the mountaintop. Though they were flying, they had to use all their might to catch up with Nana. Link followed slowly behind them to erase their marks. They could be a bit careless in the Black Forest, but this was the extreme north. They were very close to the peace. If they didn't hide themselves, it would be annoying if people came to cause trouble. The four traveled more than 150 miles like this. The sky darkened gradually. After around 50 more miles, night fell completely. Thankfully, the sky was still covered in stars. There was also ice and snow everywhere, so their vision wasn't affected. This place was not inhabitable and very few people stepped into this world of ice during the millenniums. Even the courageous adventurers wouldn't come here. In many legends, this was even known as the end of the world. No one knew what they would run into. For safety reasons, Link and the others slowed down. To avoid surprising some unknown existences, they didn't even use spells and just walked on foot. Though they were magicians, all three had strong bodies. Nana went without saying. It was a bit cold, but they could handle it. After a while, the cold wind stopped. Crunch, crunch. Other than the sound of stepping in snow, the world was silent. It's as quiet as a cemetery here. Iliard hugged himself, feeling a bit anxious. Milos looked side to side, hands gripping his wand tightly in preparation. I just feel strange, like something's watching us. Nana continued forward as before. She didn't feel anything abnormal. Link felt something strange too. This place was too quiet. His magician instincts told him that if he continued walking, something would happen. However, this feeling was fuzzy. Like a spider web in the breeze, it was hard to grasp. All Link could do was compose himself and walk on in full alert. As he walked, Link's heart suddenly jumped. The surroundings had suddenly fallen silent. He couldn't even hear footsteps anymore. Turning around hurriedly, he saw that Iliard, Milos, and Nana had all disappeared from the boundless tundra. Other than the white snow, there was nothing else around him. Strange. How did they disappear? Link furrowed his brows. He hadn't felt the surroundings change during this process. There were no mana ripples, spatial ripples, or anything else. The three just vanished. Link wouldn't believe it. He walked to where their footprints had disappeared to check. He cast many detection spells but to no avail. This was a bit strange. Link stood in place to think. A few seconds later, he decided to retreat. 
What had happened was outside his range. Going forward wasn't wise. He turned to walk back, but then it felt even more wrong. Deep in the extreme north, white snow was everything. Paired with the fact that it was night and even the wind had stopped, it was difficult to find one's direction. Link could still tell north from south though. The southern sky was slightly brighter than the north. He also had a compass. Relying on the magnetic field, he could precisely distinguish north and south. But now, Link discovered that the sky before and behind him was still the same sky. He looked down at the compass. It stayed frozen, it couldn't distinguish the direction. Link spun around and discovered something even more shocking. The four sides are the same. They're all going northward. No matter how I move, I'll get closer to the northernmost point. The space must have been distorted, but I've never seen this technique before. At this time, the sword spirit said, Link, for some reason, I suddenly thought of something. Link really wanted to drag the sword spirit out of the sword and beat it up. Why did it have to wait until something had happened to tell him? Was it playing with Link? He sighed and asked, What is it? Tell me. I think it's about that person. The one who'd stopped the Storm Lord from carelessly throwing the piece away. I suddenly remembered what he'd said. No, I didn't remember it. It just jumped out by itself. Hearing this, Link's heart twitched. He felt that things weren't as simple as he thought. There seemed to be something existing in the sword spirit's memory that planned this. What did he say? He said that this is the first step. It's a solo challenge. Oh? Link fell into deep thought and came up with two points. First, everyone who came here probably had to face this test alone. Thus, Iliard, Milos, and Nana were separated from him. Second, he wasn't the only who could pass this test, so there must be a second and third step until there was a final winner. Here, Link stopped thinking. He continued walking deep into the icy plain. Soon after he entered the test, two fiery red figures arrived. They were Hamilton and Noah, infernal warriors from Aragu. They didn't have the calmness as when they'd first arrived in Fireman. They were in a panic as if a beast was chasing after them. Their glamorous leather armor had become tattered, and they were wounded too. Hamilton especially had a still bleeding injury under his ribs. His pallor was white, and his steps were unsteady. Noah beside him wasn't any better. She'd had two curved fire swords but only had one now. There was a menacing wound on her right arm. The blood had frozen already, but more blood kept seeping from the ice. Her arm trembled. F asterisk CK, they're still chasing. Hamilton gritted out. Speaking had pulled at his injury. He immediately clutched his chest and grunted. I didn't expect magicians in this world to be so powerful. Noah's eyes were filled with terror. These people were too frightening. They weren't as strong. But no matter how the two fought, they couldn't hit the enemy. And the enemy seemed able to predict their every move, always beating them to it. If not for their power and the fear of the enemy, they wouldn't be able to escape here. Hamilton still wouldn't admit defeat. Hmph. <laughs> they had four people and attacked secretly. Of course, we weren't their match. If it was one-on-one, -on -one, I'd have them with one strike. Noah didn't speak. She knew that this was just Hamilton's ego speaking. In reality, they might not be a match even in a one-on-one -on -one battle. The dark and light magicians were especially terrifying. The two continued running forward without caring about anything else. Without realizing, the wind stopped, and then Hamilton felt his surroundings empty. He turned around, but Noah was gone. Noah? Noah? He called. There was no reply. Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. The Red Dragon Queen's group also arrived. Eugene sniffed the air and cackled. Those two aren't far from us. Go, we'll catch them soon. The other three could feel this too and naturally started chasing. After a while, the four were all in the strange territory, separated by the strange force. Suddenly, the icy tundra had nine legendary figures and a legendary Iliard trapped. These ten were facing the test of a certain ancient figure. This is a 7 English podcast and you're listening to Advent of the Archmage. Chapter 592. A fragment has been found. One half. Am I back again? 
Link looked at the footprints on the ground again and realized that it was the same place that he had passed by moments ago. It was also the place where Iliard, Milos, and Nana had vanished. This was the third time Link had walked by the same place. He realized that he had been walking in an endless loop. Strictly speaking, it might even be a four-dimensional closed loop he was dealing with. In this icy wasteland in the far north, no matter which way he went, he would always return to the loop's point of origin. Time in the outside world would also rewind back to the moment when Iliard and the others had disappeared without a trace. It was easy to spot a spatial loop. On the other hand, no ordinary human being would be able to notice a loop in time, especially when he or she was trapped in an icy region where there was nothing but ice as far as the eye could see. The wind was silent, and nothing stood out as a point of reference for Link. Link would not have been able to sense a time loop as well, had it not been for the fact that he had spent most of his time studying his time magic book recently. Though he still had a long way to go, his research had bore some fruit, such as the fact that he was able to sense a stagnation in time. Link decided not to walk in circles any longer. He sat down on the snowy ground. With one hand on his forehead, he tried to remember what had happened before, hoping to find some clue for him to break out of this loop. Though he sat there, motionless, his mind was working at a feverish pace trying to piece together an explanation for his situation. Not only was he going through his own thoughts, but he was also flipping through the time magic book in his mind in an attempt to corroborate his own theories. After silently sitting there for a long time, Link suddenly jerked up from his thoughts. He finally discovered the secret behind the loop he was trapped in. It may seem like an endless loop, but it still has a point of origin. Otherwise, I would not have ended up here in the first place. The loop's origin is its endpoint. It is also my way out of here. He stood up and drew out his ode of a full moon sword. Under the starry sky, he stabbed at six different points around him with his sword. A runic wheel appeared from the sword's tip with each stab. There were countless smaller rings of runes within each runic wheel. At a glance, it looked like the interior of a clock, its gears rotating rapidly with each other inside it. When Link was done, six exquisite hexagonal runic wheels now surrounded him. As the wheels spun on for three seconds, Link heard the sound of ice breaking. Soon, his surroundings began changing drastically around him. The silent, dark, icy wasteland was now fading away quickly before Link. Snow then whirled around him alongside the wind, which roared into Link's ears like a wild beast. The surrounding temperature had dropped to a few hundred degrees below zero in an instant. The cold was now beyond bearable. Even Link's magic robe could not resist the freezing cold. His eyes felt like they were about to freeze up and fall out of their sockets. There was no way a human body would be able to withstand such temperatures. He needed to warm himself up as quickly as possible. One of the most convenient methods for any magician to keep warm would be magic itself. Before, Link would have cast a spell to do so without hesitation. However, at the moment, he decided not to use magic. In order to magically keep oneself warm, a magician would need to focus on maintaining the spell's effect on himself. This would not have been a problem to Link under any other circumstances. But given the erratic nature of his surroundings at the moment, he would not be able to react in time to any sudden changes if he had to focus on two things at the same time. This was not a risk he was willing to take. Instead of magic, Link decided to use a new technique that he had acquired after practicing the Beastman King Avatar's Soul Furnace technique. The energy in Link's body began to circulate at an accelerated pace as he willed it to. As a result, he began to feel his body warming up more and more. The heat in him flowed through his every vein to every extremity of his body. In a matter of seconds, the numbness in his body was gone. Link had regained the feeling in his limbs. In truth, the technique that Link had just used was similar to the way a warrior used his battle aura. This was an easy task for a warrior, but to a magician, it would have been extremely difficult. A magician was usually accustomed to drawing out mana from within, forming magical constructs outside his body and then summoning the elements of his surroundings to fight his battles. In truth, magicians had little to no mastery over their physical bodies. There had also never been a magician bold enough to cast a spell on himself. Even casting a supplementary spell on oneself was a taboo in itself. This was due to the damage a magician could cause to his own body by doing such a thing. 
But now, Link had transcended the difference in power between magicians and warriors by using the Beastman's legendary battle technique, the Soul Furnace. This was only made possible by his mastery over his own power. His body was now warming up. Link glared at the freezing wind as he pressed on towards the north. The voice of his sword spirit echoed in his head, there's that voice again. It said that this is the second test. Understood, said Link, as he continued walking forward. Soon, Link realized that the air was getting colder by the minute. As a result, he was losing body heat quickly. He needed to speed up the circulation of his energy in his body before he froze to death. After walking a few hundred feet forward, a message popped up in Link's line of sight. Straining his eyes, he saw that it was a warning message from the game system. Attention. Attention. Player's current realm essence recovery rate is at 134 points per second, while current rate of power usage is at 135 points per second. Player's power reserve is beginning to drop. Link's current maximum power was 10,365 realm essence points, which was more than what the Red Dragon Queen had by 30% if converted into dragon power. Also, his current recovery rate was 134 points per second, which meant that his power was virtually unlimited. However, in order to withstand the cold, his power recovery rate had taken a huge hit. The first test was to test how much I understand about space and time. What's the second test about this time? Is it testing the level of mastery I have over my power? As soon as the thought flashed across Link's mind, he heard the sound of ice breaking again amid the howling of the freezing wind. He narrowed his eyes, trying to see what was up ahead, but the flying snow around him was so dense he could not see a thing. Just then, he felt a slight protrusion beneath his feet. He lowered his eyes and saw that a huge number of cracks had appeared on the ground that he was standing. The cracks were dark inside. Link could not see how deep they went. A piece of ice fell off the edge of a crack. Sounds of its collisions against the ice walls echoed from within the abyss as it fell. Link had no idea just how deep the crack was. A moment later, the ice beneath Link's feet began to give way. In a flash, Link tiptoed his way across the gradually collapsing ice layer. His body floated gracefully through the air and finally landed on a patch of ice in a corner. Link could have used one of his spells throughout the whole thing. He chose not to, as he could sense that there was an unseen danger lurking beneath the ice layer. If he had cast a spell to help himself across the collapsing ice, he would be distracted by said danger and consequently fall to his doom. This was why he chose to use a battle technique instead. Before he could let out a sigh of relief, the layer of ice he had landed on suddenly began to collapse as well. Link sprang up, sailed lightly through the air and landed on a patch of ice that was still intact. Without warning, the ice there began to break, and Link leaped into the air once more. This whole process went on without any danger of Link stumbling in midair. An outside observer would probably notice that Link was stepping on falling pieces of ice throughout the whole ordeal. The layer of ice he landed on would collapse, and Link would leap off fragments of it in the air as he moved forward. It seemed as if he was literally walking on air. This went on for around 10 minutes. In that time, Link had taken 1329 steps forward across 10 miles of ice without missing a step or slowing down. It was as if he had rehearsed for such an occasion. When he took his 1330th step, his foot finally hit solid ice which did not give way immediately. This circular patch of ice was around a hundred square feet. In the middle of it stood a man completely covered in frost. Before Link even had time to plant both feet on the ground, the man came at him, appearing before Link in the blink of an eye. An ice sword materialized in his hand and was already less than a feet away from piercing through Link's chest. No magician or warrior would have been able to react to such an attack in time, especially after experiencing what Link had gone through. They would be stabbed by the man's eye sword before they even knew what hit them. Anyone on the wrong end of this sword would be killed in an instant. However, Link was not just an ordinary magician. As he was leaping off a of falling ice, he had already spotted the ice man in the distance. His power had already flowed into his sword. When the ice man teleported before him, Link immediately stabbed at him with his ode of a full moon sword. He then activated the time sword technique, which had the effect of 1000 years squeezed into the span of a mere second. 
As the ode of a full moon sword lightly touched the tip of the ice sword, cracks began appearing across its blade. An instant later, the entire ice sword burst into a fine powder. In this realm, nothing could withstand the destructive power of accelerated time. After shattering the ice sword, Link swung his sword up and stabbed the ice man's forehead with it in one fluid motion. Power then flowed into the tip of his sword, activating an incredibly destructive fire spell that belonged to the dragon race, Ball of Destruction. Purple light flashed out from the ice man's head. Then, his body fell down limply and melted into a puddle of water. The puddle of water froze up immediately in the cold. As the puddle of water turned into a new sheet of ice, Link's surroundings began to change again. The blizzard was gone, and so was the biting cold. A full moon had appeared in the sky. Up ahead rose a towering mountain of ice. On the peak of the mountain was a platform, from which shone a faint light. Looking closely, Link realized that a broken stone fragment was the light's source. The fragment of the Book of Creation. Excited by his discovery, Link began to climb up the mountain to retrieve his prize. Just then, the sword spirit said, the third test has begun. Five flashes of light appeared in quick succession not far away from Link. There were silhouettes standing in the light. One of them was no more than 300 feet away from him. Link narrowed his eyes. Eugene. Eugene looked disheveled. His black robe was torn in certain places. His hair was in a mess, and there were even bloody wounds on his face. A look of surprise flitted across his face when he saw Link, but he quickly got a grip of himself and laughed out loud. Ha ha, if it isn't the Lord of Ferd himself. Never thought I would find you here, of all places. This is a 7 English podcast and you're listening to Advent of the Archmage. Chapter 593, Moment of Testing One's Heart The icy peaks loomed under the moonlight. Under the mountain, six people appeared, Link, Dark Magician Eugene, Light Magician Helino, Iliard, Nana, and a warrior with tattered red armor and a curved sword. Wait, another beam of light appeared around 1,500 feet to the left of Link. The light subsided, revealing Red Dragon Queen Gretel. So there were seven people. Gretel didn't seem to be in good shape. She was covered in wounds, and her fiery red dress was torn at places. After she appeared, crystal red power surged, and her injuries started healing at a speed visible to the naked eye. Even her dress was mended. Seeing Link, she flinched and then looked away. She didn't speak. No one else appeared after that. Milos never came. Link guessed that he couldn't pass the test. Now, the piece of the Book of Creation was not far from the Seven. Gretel was 1,500 feet to the left of Link. The Dark Magician Eugene was to his right. After that was the Light Magician and the Warrior before finally getting to Iliard and Nana. Link's position was disadvantageous. He was right between three outsiders. The treasure was before them, and the situation was unclear. Thus, everyone was on alert. No one wanted to be the first to go. They couldn't keep at this stalemate though. Light Magician Helino spoke up first. Third Lord, the piece isn't that useful. If you take it. Before he could finish, the voice rang out from the mountain again. Younglings, I am very happy that you all passed the test. The fact that you are here means that you all have a talent that the others do not have. It may be power, wisdom, lineage, or even pure luck. You are the top-tier geniuses of the era. Now you have come for the piece of the Book of Creation. Unfortunately, there is only one piece. That means only one person can receive it. Who are you? Eugene called. Me? I'm just a remnant of a soul left from the ancient times. I am the protector of the ancient sovereign wisdom. What benefits does that piece have? Eugene asked again. Benefits? Didn't you come because you knew? It is the key that can open the authority of the world tree. Because it is the biggest piece, it contains more than 50% of the creation runes in the book. With it, you can control the world tree and become the most powerful of this realm. You can rule over the countless lives and firemen. Control the world tree? The most powerful who could rule over lives. Other than Nana, everyone present stopped breathing for a moment. Even Link's heart skipped a beat at this. 
Link wasn't greedy for the ultimate power of ruling all lives. His heart sped up because of what the piece represented. It could help someone become the ultimate ruler and control countless fates. The fact that it existed was terrifying. Imagine if someone got it. If they really became the most powerful as this protector said, then Link, his loved ones, and his friends would all be ruled by them. If they didn't like the new magic institution he'd established in Ferd, they could destroy it easily. These thoughts flowed through his mind. Instantly, Link discovered that he only had one choice, fight for the peace. Link didn't lower his guard while thinking. He kept watching the people beside him from the corner of his vision, especially Eugene. In his mind, he also asked the sword spirit, is the peace truly that powerful? It might not have been in the ancient times. When all level 19 lords united, they could still defeat the sovereign. But now, there are barely any strong figures. Perhaps it's true? The sword spirit made sense. At this time, Link suddenly saw a message pop up in his vision. He checked and saw it was actually from the game system. Activate mission, the piece that shouldn't exist. Mission content, the piece of the book of creation is too powerful. Its existence will only push the fireman realm deeper into danger. Destroy it so no sovereign can appear in this world. Mission reward 1, brilliant starry crown, level 19. Mission reward 2, 1000 omni points. Punishment for failure, light curse. Light curse. Divine technique. Effect, the punishment of the god of light. The curse will have their power forever sealed by the god of light and die within three years. Note, God can instantly destroy a mortal's power and cause them to fall from the clouds, making them experience despair. This mission was very cruel. Link glanced at it and then ignored it. He wasn't that naive kid anymore. He knew what he wanted to do and didn't want anyone to interfere. Even if it was a God tempting him with level 19 magic equipment, he would still be unmoved. The Red Dragon Queen spoke now to everyone present. This peace will cause a great imbalance in the world's power. I don't wish anyone to receive it, so I will do my best to destroy it. If I succeed, the world will be in luck. If not, I hope Fireman can be eternal. As she spoke, thick red light appeared on her body. They formed the illusion of a dragon. Half a second later, she transformed into dragon form. Hearing this, dark magician Eugene yelled, Gretel, what's wrong with you? Didn't you say that we'd use this to stop the High Elves? How come you've turned now? Light Magician Helino also said, Your Majesty, I agree, but let's use it to stop the High Elves first, and then destroy it. The Red Dragon Queen shook her head resolutely. No, once this piece arrives at the World Tree, no one will be able to resist its temptation, not even me. Thus, I must destroy it now. You crazy woman! Eugene yelled. Dark flames faded in and out around him as he berated. Without it, we'll all die when the realms fuse and mana explodes. So what? Life will pass. My race's mission to maintain the balance in the world is truly eternal. Gretel's voice was calm. Her eyes were also calm. She'd seen everything in the world. In the distance, Inferno warrior Hamilton watched all this and burst into laughter. It's laughable. It's truly laughable. You haven't even gotten the peace, and you have internal fights already. There'll be a great show next. All right, don't look at me. I'm not your match. You guys take it while I get out of here. Seeing this was enough for me. With that, he turned around and walked back. Soon, he was gone. Even his aura had disappeared. He really wasn't going to continue this fight. Six people were left. Iliard looked to Link. What do you plan on doing? He wasn't interested in ruling. To him, the best thing in life was to quietly study magic and spend his time with his loved one. This had mostly come true in Ferd. Now, this peace was threatening his happy life. His intent was the same as the Red Dragon Queen. He would do his best to destroy the peace. However, if Link wanted it, he would also try his best to get it for Link. He knew that the world wasn't as beautiful as he thought. He may not want it, but that didn't mean others didn't want it. Link getting the peace was better than others getting it. As for Nana, 
she would do whatever Link said. Helena looked at Link and hurriedly said, Lord Morani, don't forget the crazy plan of the High Elves. I believe the wisest choice is to take the peace, stop the High Elves, and then destroy it. If you agree to help us get it, I can take three astro meteorites from my personal archive as compensation. As soon as he finished, Eugene said, Lord Morani, you have common sense. Helino's plan doesn't have any problems. If you agree, I'll add three more astral meteorites. On the other side, the Red Dragon Queen didn't say anything. She also looked at Link. She was clear that whether or not she could destroy this terrible piece depended on Link. He already had a plan. Glancing at the piece on the mountain, he smiled. Actually, I... Before he could finish, there was another flash. When the light subsided, a dwarf appeared. It was the mountain sage, Hiroto. This was another variable. This is a 7 English podcast and you're listening to Advent of the Archmage. Chapter 594, I don't know what you're thinking. Hiroto was in a state of disorder when he appeared. His white beard had been sheared unevenly by some sharp object and stained by blood. His clothes were in tatters. He looked around. Feeling that something was not right, he asked, Helino, what happened here? Did I miss anything? Helino chuckled. No, you've arrived just in time, Hiroto. Eugene said, Hiroto, I'm telling you, the Red Dragon Queen's lost it. She's turned on us. She wants to destroy the Book of Creation's fragment. If Hiroto had not appeared and Link had chosen to side with the Red Dragon Queen, both Eugene and Helino would have lost all hope of retrieving the Book of Creation's fragment. But now, their overall strength had received a huge boost with the appearance of Hiroto. They now had an advantage over the Red Dragon Queen. Even if Link allied himself with her, it would not have made a difference. Also, Link was a reasonable person. He would definitely be able to see that he had no chance of winning against them. Not wanting to risk annihilation alongside the Queen, Link would naturally choose to pull out from their dispute. The Red Dragon Queen might even be thinking about taking all three of them on her own. If she was still intent on stopping them, it would only mean her death. Gretel had also noticed the sudden change in her situation. She turned to Hiroto. No, Great Sage, the Book of Creation's fragment is just too powerful. Whoever has it will. Eugene, you bastard. Are you looking to die so soon? Before she even finished, she realized that Eugene had already raced up the mountain ahead of them. As he streaked up the mountain, he shouted back, There's nothing to be said between us, Gretel. Our opinions differ greatly. Trying to persuade the other to see one's point of view would simply be an exercise in futility. Helino, Hiroto, stop her. Gretel opened her mouth wide, and a huge fire pillar surged out from it towards the dark magician Eugene like a sharp sword. It did not matter whether Link decided to side with her. It did not matter if she had to see this fight through on her own. Even if it meant risking death, she would do whatever it took to destroy the Book of Creation's fragment. And so, she did not hesitate to make the first move against Eugene. Hiroto was still unclear about the situation. The atmosphere was already tense when he appeared in their midst. Seeing that Gretel had struck out at Eugene, Hiroto decided to join forces with Helino and Eugene. He pointed his wand at the ground. Mountain surge. A rumbling sound came from the ground. In an instant, the ground rose up, forming a 500-foot tall, 1,000-foot wide, 100-foot thick stone wall. It was as if a huge mountain had appeared out of thin air. The 5-foot thick dragon breath hit the stone wall. Streaks of fire and light flew off in all directions upon impact, and molten rock flowed from the wall, but the attack did not penetrate the thick stone wall. Gretel, what are you doing? Hiroto could not grasp the Red Dragon Queen's actions. Helino said hurriedly, save your questions for later, Hiroto. Our top priority now is to retrieve the Book of Creation's fragment before anything happens to it. This sounded reasonable. Still unclear about the whole situation, Hiroto decided not to think too much about it for now and pointed his wand at the Red Dragon Queen's feet. Earthquake. With another rumbling, the ground beneath the Red Dragon Queen began to roil like an ocean surface during a storm. 
Gretel spread out her wings and rushed into the sky in a whoosh. She then spewed dragon breath at Hiroto as she flew up. Another huge pillar of fire surged out from her mouth. This was not all. A dark purple fireball was now taking shape in front of the Red Dragon Queen's massive body. It gradually expanded into a three-foot-wide purple-black fireball. Ball of Destruction Dragon Breath surged towards Helino and Mountain Sage Hiroto like an avalanche. On the other hand, the Ball of Destruction hurtled towards the Mountain Sage's huge stone barrier and collided into the huge hole that Gretel had managed to carve into it with her first burst of dragon fire. In the next second, an explosion shook the earth. The Ball of Destruction had exploded, shattering the stone barrier into pieces. The stone that formed the barrier melted into hot molten lava, which burst out in all directions at incredible speed. In an instant, lava sprayed out as far as a few thousand feet around the point of impact. From afar, it looked as if someone had set off a lava-filled firework. This was an indiscriminate attack, covering everyone and everything within its area in an instant. It also had tremendous power. Each blob of lava that was sent flying into the air could reach level 11 or above in terms of power. Only the Red Dragon Queen was able to unleash an attack of this magnitude with ease. In the midst of this catastrophic display of fire and smoke, a flash of white light appeared. It was Link's spatial portal. Just as everyone else was busy taking cover, Link appeared beside Iliard and Nana and conjured a spatial barrier around them. As soon as the barrier appeared, hot molten lava began falling from the sky and onto the spatial barrier. The barrage of lava was then suspended in midair by this transparent barrier before it hit the ground. Through the spatial barrier, all three of them saw that Helino, Hiroto, and even Eugene stopped in their tracks in order to set up their magical defenses against this attack. Seeing the raging red dragon queen floating in the air, Iliard could not help but exclaim, the dragon's queen really is powerful to be able to hold her own against three legendary masters. Nana thought otherwise. She was staring at Helino. She then whispered, two seconds. Two seconds until what? asked Iliard. Link replied, two seconds from now, the light magician Helino will retaliate. Judging from the flow of energy within him, the attack he's preparing will be lethal. She'll die from it. Updated by Novel Full. Helino was a level 13 master who had seen much in the world for the last hundred or so years. He was a peerless master whose power was second to none. The Red Dragon Queen was simply not a match for him. Link's hand was already holding up the ode of a full moon sword as he said this. Though his choice differed slightly from the others, Link was still of the opinion that the Red Dragon Queen's continued existence would benefit Link and Ferd more than her demise. And so, if Gretel was really in trouble, he would have to step up and come to her aid. As the terrifying shower of lava came to an end, Helino's voice rang out. Your Highness, this is getting ridiculous. I've always held you in the highest esteem. But now, you've gone too far. You seem to forget that I too have a temper. Helino was now holding a white crystal magic wand. He pointed at the sky, and a faint golden light flashed out from the tip of the wand into the air. Light's fury, lightning retribution. There was a rumble in the sky. Almost at the same time, a streak of lightning descended from the clouds like a golden electric serpent, striking the red dragon queen squarely. The golden lightning's power was incredible. When it flashed out, the whole sky was lit up as bright as day. The ice plane was bathed in a golden light, holy and pure like an angel's halo. Though the red dragon queen's body was massive, her size was trivial in comparison to the sheer force of Helino's lightning attack. Iliard's eyes widened, unable to believe what he had just seen. He was at a loss for words, unable to comprehend the terrifying attack Helino had just unleashed. If one had compared the Red Dragon Queen's Ball of Destruction attack to the Earth's terrible fury, then the light magician Helino's lightning retribution attack was like a divine punishment meted out directly by a god. It had come straight from the heavens with enough power to bring all mortals down to their knees in reverential awe. The earth might be powerful, but it was still inferior to the heavens. Anyone could see that the Red Dragon Queen would not be able to survive the attack. Link was still gripping on the ode of a full moon sword. However, a moment later, he loosened his grip. 
He knew that the Red Dragon Queen must have something up her sleeve. She would not be killed so easily by this. The bolt of lightning pierced through the Red Dragon Queen's body as it descended from the heavens. It seemed to have hit her, but in the next second, her body began to fade until it finally vanished. Was she hit by the lightning? Iliard asked, stunned. No, she's entered the Sea of Void, whispered Nana. The golden lightning bolt was indeed powerful, but the Red Dragon Queen did not bother defending herself against it. Her dragon body was a vessel meant for crossing the void. She must have realized that she was completely outmatched by Helino, and so chose to slip into the void to avoid the attack. Um? Helino was stunned by this as well. He had assumed that the queen had lost her mind completely. The fact that she still retained her combat sense had caught him by surprise. Eugene, stay alert. She could ambush you from anywhere. Helino shouted at the dark magician, who was already halfway up the mountain. I know, just mind your own business. Ah, going after the fragment yourself, eh? No longer caring where the queen might strike next, Eugene continued making his way up towards the mountain's peak. Helino had also turned into a ball of golden light, which sped off towards the peak of the mountain. Though he and Eugene had formed a temporary alliance, Helino was not about to let Eugene lay his hands on the fragment. Once Eugene had gotten hold of such a treasure, there was no way he would ever let it go again. Things would become even more troublesome at that point. Both light and dark magicians raced up the mountain towards its peak. Mountain sage Hiroto remained confused, unsure of what was happening right now. Had they not all agreed to retrieve the fragment together? The Lord of Ferd had been standing on the sidelines of this fight that had broken out among them. Was it not him they had all come to stop from wreaking havoc? Why did they all start fighting one another? Seeing that the two magicians were getting closer towards the peak, Iliard asked, Should we move in, Link? The fate of Ferd should not be up to these two outsiders to decide. Iliard realized just then that wanting to live a peaceful life was an extremely tricky business. The world was filled with ambitious schemers vying for a huge piece of it. Their every action could easily upset the balance of the world if they were not careful enough. The only surefire way of taking control of one's own fate was to become even stronger than these masters. There were only two options available to Iliard and the others right now, either let the Book of Creation's fragment be destroyed, or let Ferd have it. Link did not move. Still looking at both light and dark magicians, he said in a low voice, things aren't as simple as they look. The Red Dragon Queen may reappear at any moment, and the Book of Creation's fragment is still protected by a defensive barrier and the will of a guardian. We'll see how things go. A second after Link finished speaking, Helino and Eugene were basically near the mountaintop. Just then, ripples began to form near where they were. A moment later, a faint purple light burst out from the Sea of Void. It was the Red Dragon Queen's Dragon Void Breath. I've been expecting, you Red Lizard, said Eugene. He had completely dispensed with formalities at this point. He pointed his wand at where the dragon breath was coming from. Dark canvas. A glittering sheet of darkness before Eugene, blocking the dragon void breath attack from Gretel. Your Highness, you're outmatched. Helino had also joined in the counterattack against the Red Dragon Queen. Pointing his wand, he shouted, Judgment of Light. It was another level, 13 light spell. A golden light surged into the depths of the void, drilling into it like a cyclone. The force of the attack was incredible. Iliard and Nana could not see what was going on, but Link was now ready to leap into the fray and put an end to the fight. The Red Dragon Queen was up against two legendary masters. As a level, 11 Dragon Queen, even with the advantage she had by hiding herself in the Sea of Void, she could not possibly defeat two level, 13 veteran masters by herself. Link figured that the Red Dragon Queen would sustain heavy injuries from this fight at best. Just when Link decided to step into the fight, something happened. There was a hum. Light shot out from the mountain peak, hitting everyone present. At that point, all six of them were completely immobilized. Even the clashing spells were frozen in midair. Then, the voice of the Guardian sounded. All right, people, that's enough. I've seen what you have chosen. A white silhouette appeared on the platform at the mountaintop. 
His gaze swept across everyone before finally coming to rest on Link. Except you. I don't really know what you're thinking. This is a 7 English podcast and you're listening to Advent of the Archmage. Chapter 595, The True Ruthlessness Begins. When the white light enveloped everyone, no one could move. They could only stand dazedly in place. It wasn't that they didn't struggle. In reality, everyone tried to escape from the restraints. However, the power was formless and insubstantial. It looked like faint white light, but no matter how the people tried, they couldn't budge, not even Link. This horrible power was way above their abilities. When the protector looked at Link, the Red Dragon Queen, Light and Dark Magicians, the Mountain Sage, and even Iliard also looked at Link. He had the strongest combat ability but hadn't done anything yet. Faced with a treasure that could help someone quickly take control of firemen, his opinion was the most important. Link had already confirmed he couldn't escape from the white light. It should be at level, 19. In the game, he'd reached this step too. A level, 19 magician indeed could restrain a few magicians who were at most level, 13. This wasn't difficult. Faced with this absolute power, all struggles were in vain. Link stopped moving. Faced with the protector's question, he replied calmly, I think that your idea is meaningless. An idea is just a strategy in my mind. It doesn't mean it'll really happen. Oh, you aren't willing to say it? The protector was a bit surprised. Your viewpoint is very realistic. However, to those who are blessed like you all, ideas are basically reality. Thus, your first idea is still very important. He turned to Gretel and smiled. Like you, Red Dragon Queen. You've always followed the tradition that the dragons had followed for thousands of years. It may pain you, but still, you will not change. This piece will indeed destroy the traditional balance for the dragons. You aren't wrong. As long as it exists, there will be someone who will try anything to possess it. The countless lives in firemen will also be affected greatly. If someone who doesn't care for others takes control of it, countless of lives will be lost. The Red Dragon Queen had already floated out from the Sea of Void. Her eyes focused on the Book of Creation piece at the mountaintop. You're right, she said coldly. That is what I think. I can die for it. Very honorable, but it has nothing to do with me. The protector was unmoved. He turned to Eugene. And you, Dark Magician, are the one who wishes the most to get it. A voice deep inside tells you to get it and control the undefeatable force inferred. Turn Ferd into what you like. And what you like is a dark world where only dark magic exists. Am I right? Eugene laughed sinisterly. You're right, but you don't have to guess my plan. Those who are familiar with me know that I'd definitely do that. If I get the peace and take control of the world tree, the just and moral will have no excuse to banish me. I'd love to see the expressions of those hypocrites at that time. Humph. Helino looked down at him with extreme disdain. But the protector's expression was still calm. There was no disgust at all. No matter what, you are honest. That is one of your few good points. Thank you for the compliment. I'm flattered. Eugene leered. The protector ignored him and turned towards Helino. As for you, light magician, you say that you wish to take the peace and destroy it after stopping the high elves and ensuring the safety of firemen. But I see your hesitation. You aren't sure what you'll choose after getting it. Deep down, you know that you may take it for yourself, your actions are different from what you say. Judging from this, it fits for the dark magician to call you a hypocrite. Huh, that's great. Well said. Eugene clapped and laughed heartily. Helena was annoyed. Protector of the Book of Creation, he said coldly, you must be bored. Why exactly are you imprisoning us and raiding us all? The protector froze and then patted his forehead. Smiling, he said, oh, young man, you reminded me. I haven't talked to anyone in such a long time, and suddenly, so many people came today. I almost forgot. He turned towards Link again. Young man, the reason why you confuse me is simple. Your thoughts are always changing. 
Sometimes, you want to destroy the peace. Sometimes, you want to take it. Do you not have a clear standpoint after getting to your current status? Link didn't know how to reply. However, he felt like this annoying protector wouldn't let them go if he didn't explain himself. After thinking, he said, when I first saw it and especially after I listened to you introduce its powers. My first thought was to destroy that piece because of my fear. But then I discovered that you'd exaggerated its uses. It may let someone control the world tree, but that person will definitely pay the price. Basically, I don't understand the power of this piece. I think it's best not to hurry and make a decision about something I don't understand. Hearing this, the protector was silent for a few seconds before saying, I think I've already introduced all the functions very clearly. Link shrugged. Indeed, but it was just your introduction, and it's our first meeting. The protector was a stranger. Why should Link trust him? So what if he had a powerful background and was strong? This couldn't ensure that he wasn't lying. The protector laughed. You're brave, but in the end, you want the peace, right? Link nodded. Judging from the current situation, yes. Very good. The protector looked to Hiroto. What about you, Mountain Sage? Do you want it? I'm not interested but... The protector cut Hiroto off before he could finish. Okay, I understand. Then he looked to Iliard and Nana. You two have very simple thoughts. You either don't want it, or you aren't confident. People like you aren't qualified to possess it. In that case, you, you, and you are eliminated. As soon as he finished, there were three buzzes. Nana, Iliard, and Hiroto disappeared from the strange space. Now, there are only four people left. You four either want to get the Book of Creation or destroy it. Whether it can continue to exist or not depends on who wins in the end. While he spoke, the light enveloping the four moved slightly. They teleported to somewhere 10 miles away from the mountaintop. Looking down from here, the mountaintops that were thousands of feet tall were now little sticks of ice. The Book of Creation piece at the top was a tiny dot of light, almost invisible. Link turned around. There was no one beside him, he couldn't even sense any auras. The other three seemed to have disappeared. The protector's voice came from an unknown place and sounded in his ear, all of you are 10 miles away from the Book of Creation piece. You cannot use spatial transmissions or flight here. The restraint on your bodies will disappear at the same time. The mirages on this land will melt away too. If you want to get the peace, then use all your power. Remember, I will not interfere this time. As the voice spoke, Link felt a thin layer of light fade from the boundless plain. It was like someone lifting a huge curtain from the land. Without it, the land's original appearance was revealed. Updated by, this is a 7 English podcast and you're listening to Advent of the Archmage. Link discovered that the ground before him had changed greatly. Various steep mountains rose from the ground. Each one was miles high. Compared to them, the one with the Book of Creation was like a little round podium. They'd completely blocked the way to the Book of Creation. After the mountains consolidated, the protector's voice sounded again, now, begin. As soon as he finished, Link felt the white light around him vanish. He was standing before a ten-mile high wall. He sighed inwardly. So the true ruthlessness is just starting. The protector wouldn't interfere, and the four would chase in this maze-like mountain cluster. No one knew who would succeed, who would die, and who would receive the Book of Creation in the end. This is a 7 English podcast and you're listening to Advent of the Archmage. Chapter 596, An Unjust Treatment It was a 15,000 foot tall precipice. Its surface was as smooth as a mirror. There were little to no footholds on it. As neither teleportation nor levitation spells could be used at the moment, Link's only option now was to scale the ice wall. The Guardian was clearly more powerful than any of them. Link had no choice but to play by his rules. After trying to cast a spatial teleportation spell and making sure that what the Guardian said was true, Link began climbing up the ice wall. The frozen wall was slippery. Each foothold was carved into it at intervals of 20 feet. 
With the aid of his magic and battle techniques, climbing the precipice would have been a breeze. Link cast a spell on himself which gave himself an agility boost, Cheetah's agility. The spell cost no more than one power point. Normally, his body would have recovered this bit of power in an instant. However, after a few seconds, Link realized that his power reserve showed no sign of replenishing itself. Hmm. Has this so-called guardian blocked off all the energy channels in my body? He felt fine, which meant that no foreign power had infiltrated his body. The only other possible explanation to his current predicament was that the other party had erected a barrier around his body. Are the other three in the same situation as I am? Forget it, I don't have any proof to confirm my theory anyway. I'll need to expect the worst while dealing with this just to be on the safe side. The worst case scenario would be his power being sealed off while the other three still retained their powers. This meant that Link would need to use his power sparingly. If a confrontation were to happen, he would need to be in a position where he could strike first and fast in order to be efficient with his power reserve. Link would also need to maintain a level of secrecy. In the case of climbing the ice wall, it would be better for him not to use any spells right now so as to avoid wasting his mana and giving away his position. After thinking for a while, Link placed a firm foot on one of the footholds on the precipice. He then extracted a piece of magic steel from his spatial ring and spent two points of power to activate a Higgs force field, which reshaped the magic steel into a pair of ice axes. Link then deactivated the cheetah's agility spell that he had cast on himself just now. Updated by, this is a 7 English podcast and you're listening to Advent of the Archmage. When he dispelled the supplementary spell, the realm essence power keeping it active would be released into the air. Link was prepared for this. With a nudge of his will, he redirected it back into his own body. He was also up against two level, 13 legendary masters. They were one level above him and possessed a great deal of combat experience. He could not afford to waste even one point of power at this point if he were to stand a chance against any one of them. Gripping the ice axes tightly in his hands, Link stopped looking for footholds and swung himself up across the ice wall by brute strength. He had climbed no more than 15 feet when suddenly there was a sudden rumbling sound within the ice wall. A few seconds later, a dark aura issued violently out of it. This is Eugene's doing. Must be at least level, 9. The fact that he is able to use such a high-level spell meant that his power was not sealed off like mine was. Well, that's not fair. Though he had no idea why the Guardian had targeted only him, there was no use crying foul and getting angry about it. If he wanted to get his hands on the fragment, he would need to process his current situation calmly and devise a countermeasure against any attack. Things aren't looking too good. I'd better get past this wall of ice, quick. He then continued climbing up the ice wall, even faster than before. As he climbed, he activated a battle technique, Soul Furnace. This technique not only allowed its practitioner to have perfect mastery over one's own power, but it could also speed up the body's healing rate. Link was putting enormous strain on both his arms as he climbed. He would have been able to withstand such a strain for a moment or two. But climbing 15,000 feet without rest would definitely present its problem soon. At that moment, he sensed that the strain would severely affect his swordsmanship. However, if he sped up his body's healing rate as he climbed, with the aid of his realm essence power's naturally high recovery rate, he would probably be able to minimize the damage to his arms. Composing himself, Link continued to climb up the wall. After climbing for a while, he began to feel his body heating up. His body temperature had increased to more than 50 degrees. At the same time, he could also feel that his power level had decreased by 50 points. The 50-point loss was the result of his body mending the wear and tear in his arm muscles as soon as they appeared. At that point, Link's arms looked undamaged. Due to the continuous cycle of repair and damage that was taking place in his internal systems, they looked even sturdier than before. Link decided to rest for a while on the precipice. He then continued climbing when his temperature returned to normal. Throughout the whole process, Link could feel five distinct magical auras. One of them belonged to the Light Magician, the other two were the Dark Magicians, and the last two auras were the Red Dragon Queens. 
The three of them were using high-level spells as they pleased, not at all concerned about how much magical power they were spending. This proved Link's initial conjecture. All three of them were not hindered by the same power limitation that Link was shackled with. This unjust treatment was enough to make a man's blood boil. If that's the case, I'll only have one chance for one single burst. If I fail, that would mean death. Eugene would also take the chance to shatter my soul into pieces, thought Link. The risk was high, but there was no way Link would let the fragment fall in anyone else's hands, especially those belonging to the dark magician Eugene. After calming himself and dousing the flames of righteous anger over the injustice of his treatment in his head, Link then continued his climb. Half an hour later, Link finally reached the top of the ice wall. At the top of the ice wall, there was a small platform no wider than 20 feet. There was a steep hill behind it. Sharp icicles lined the hill's path. It looked like a sea of swords from afar. Pristine white clouds floated at the end of the path, blocking off Link's view. From where he stood, besides the white clouds in the distance, Link could not see anything else. Link made a mental note of the circular platform's coordinates. After looking around, he began walking forward. The slope of the hill was at most 60 degrees. There were places which were as slippery as a mirror. One could easily slip and tumble towards one of the icicles in front. Here, Link walked with extreme caution. After walking 50 feet down the hill path, he finally entered the sea of clouds. He could only see no more than 100 feet in front of him. Link had no idea what awaited him up ahead. For now, he could only walk on through the thick mist with his head bowed low and find out for himself. After traveling 1000 feet, he suddenly heard a distant rumble up ahead. He could also feel the clash of dragon and light auras. After a while, he heard the Red Dragon Queen's shriek. There was a hint of desperation in the high-pitched shriek as if it had been made by someone on the verge of dying. This did not bode well for the Red Dragon Queen. Aghast, Link picked up his pace. However, after taking ten steps, he slowed down. Helino must have found Gretel. It's clear she's not his match. She may already be beyond saving at this point. Link let out a sigh. Goodbye, Queen of the Dragons. The Queen's death would be a lamentable outcome. After all, they were still friends. If there was still a chance to save her, Link would take it by any means necessary. However, they were now pitted against each other in an unusually brutal testing ground. He could not afford to be lax in the face of such powerful opponents. There was nothing he could do. After a few steps, Link felt that his emotions were still in turmoil. He decided to find someplace to rest for a bit. He then began practicing the soul furnace technique on the spot. His movements were slow as he carried out every step of the form. Five minutes later, he let out a long breath. He finally managed to regain composure. Then, he continued walking forward. Another five minutes later, Link reached the bottom of the hill. Here, the mist had thinned considerably. Visibility had increased to at least 500 feet. From there, he could see mountains and towering precipices in the distance. There was a wide, flat path between the mountains. The path was at least 80 feet wide and spread out in all directions. From where Link was standing, he could see at least three forks branching off the main path. Link did not know which was the right path to take. The place was like a maze. An ordinary person would resort to trial and error, blindly taking each path until he found the right one. However, Link was magician. Naturally, he had his own way of finding the right path. He stood at the intersection, his hand holding an exquisitely crafted compass. This was the compass of ultimate truth. A magical gear imbued with secret magic, it was also an imitation made by Link. The real thing was in Eleanor's hands. Link instantly took a liking to it and made an imitation for himself. He had also added precognitive powers to it, making it even better than the original. There were three adjustable wheels in the face of the compass. Sixty-four symbols had been etched on each wheel. Calmly, Link set the outer wheel to the symbol of a tree, the middle wheel to hand, and the inner wheel to book. He then cleared his mind of all thoughts and slowly channeled his magical power into the compass. 
This was to ensure that his own thoughts would not interfere with the compass function. Unobstructed by his thoughts, his unconscious mind was able to ask the compass the question that Link wanted answers. There was a needle in the middle of the compass. A few seconds later, it began to tremble violently until it pointed at the leftmost road. The needle had been guided by the mysterious hand of fate. Link kept his compass and headed for the left fork without hesitation. After walking 1,000 feet, another intersection appeared in front of him. Sharp icicles had sprouted on both sides of the road. It was as if Link had entered a crystalline forest. Suddenly, Link sensed that he was being watched by someone. I've been spotted. He stopped in his tracks. His hand now holding the ode of a full moon sword, Link felt for the presence of his unseen enemy with his five senses spread out in all directions. This is a seven English podcast and you're listening to Advent of the Archmage. Chapter 597, Instant Battle of Life or Death. Pad, pad, pad. Link walked down the tunnel within the icy peaks. The constant soft footsteps hit the walls on either side and bounced back, creating overlapping echoes in his ears. This was the only sound in the ice tunnel. After around 50 steps, there was a cross section. The place was quite wide. It was an open area of a few hundred feet wide. There were many sword-like stalagmites piercing into the sky. All of them overlapped and crisscrossed like a huge ice flower. Suddenly, Link felt in his heart a strange aura coming from a huge ice flower on his left. That moment, Link's senses sped up dramatically. He felt time slow down. Instantly, the basic information of this abnormal aura flashed past Link's mind. 240 feet to the left, level 13, dark, power is consolidating, about to erupt, danger. Each fact was short, but they were indispensable in battle. As for other things, such as the attacker's identity, method, and more would need deduction to figure out. Link didn't have that in his mind. He didn't think either because that would cost additional reaction time. In a battle like this, the faster he reacted, the more advantages he had. After another instant, around one thousandth of a second, a solution flashed past Link's mind. Give up defending and attack immediately. The other was at level 13, but Link had much magic equipment. Defending against this attack would be hard but not impossible. However, if he used the defense tactic, he would fall into an awkward disadvantage. He would use up much realm essence to block a level 13 spell, and he wouldn't be able to recover. Even if he won, he would have lost a lot. This was disadvantageous towards later battles. And once he started defending, he would enter a stalemate even if he succeeded. Then that would cost even more power. So if he wanted to win and get the Book of Creation piece, in the end, he only had one option, fight to attack first. During the instant decision, the ode of a full moon was unsheathed at the same time. As the sword flashed, the consolidated realm essence flowed like a river. It seemed smooth, but there were undercurrents that rushed into the sword. The entire sword glowed. The light didn't just come from its surface. It shone from deep inside, turning the sword translucent like crystal. The glow was like moonlight. It poured into all directions, instantly washing the entire tunnel in frosty white. At the same time, a rune halo appeared around the sword's tip. There were smaller halos inside this halo. The countless rings vibrated and turned at the same time. It was detailed and precise to the point of not being able to see it clearly. The next moment, a black vortex appeared before the ode of a full moon's halo. The sword tip buried into it, and reappeared 240 feet to Link's left. That moment, countless runes flew at the tip. The silver moonlight was cold as frost. This was Link's strongest attack spell, time. As time flew by, seas could turn to land. The sword soared for around one thousandth of a second and moved 30 centimeters before hitting something soft. There was a stalemate for around three hundredth of a second. In the first one hundredth of a second, Link could clearly feel the powerful repulsion force from the soft object. It kept resisting the ode of a full moon, wanting to push the sword out. This strength was impossibly powerful and completely surpassed Link's limit. He almost lost control of the sword. But this only lasted for one hundredth of a second. After that, the power of time came into effect. Under the extreme passage of time, 
the soft object's power decreased rapidly. It entered the stalemate period. This lasted another one hundredth of a second. The opponent continued to weaken. The ode of a full moon began to get the upper hand. During the last one hundredth of a second, the other's power collapsed completely. The sword stabbed in. Squelch. That familiar sound and feeling was of a sword piercing flesh. In the Orita Fortress, Link had personally used his sword to kill more than 5,000 people. He was very familiar with the feeling of a weapon entering flesh, so he felt it at once. Realm Essence flowed through the sword and rushed into the opponent's body. It didn't simply rush in. When it flowed past the sword, it started forming mana structures. Because of Realm Essence's perfect controllability, the speed was at the maximum speed. Instantly, it formed a destruction spell, Ball of Destruction. It entered the opponent's body next. Then, Link retracted his sword. During this process, he'd already started retreating at full force. His body flashed and then hid behind a thick stalagmite. It wasn't enough to block the opponent's attack, but it could hide him, making the opponent lose their target momentarily. This was to prevent their last attack before death. While Link did all this, less than one-tenth of a second had passed. Link couldn't do this before. He would have needed at least two-tenths of a second to perform it completely. This was all thanks to the Beastman legendary battle technique, Soul Furnace. Just as Link hid behind the ice pillar, a tragic cry came from his near distance. Following it was an explosive boom. Then, a power aura with fire and darkness traveled over. Link turned to take a glance. He saw a dark purple flame billow from behind a stalagmite. Around the fire were pieces of blood and flesh. Amongst it, Link saw a bloody skull. Judging from the hair color, it was Dark Magician Eugene. Now, Link realized belatedly that his sneak attacker was this Dark Magician. He'd taken care of it with one strike. Eugene was weaker than he'd imagined. A semi-transparent shadow flew up from the ruins at an incredible speed, rushing into the sky. It should be Eugene's soul. If he'd flown a bit slower, Link wouldn't mind adding another strike to shatter the soul. He couldn't do that now, though. Eugene must be skilled in soul spells. After leaving this time, he will definitely use some method to be reincarnated. At that time, I'll have a new nemesis. I must be careful about this. Of course, Link didn't have any regrets. In the previous situation, it was life or death. Since Link could kill Eugene once, he could do it a second time. He wouldn't underestimate Eugene's destructiveness because of this, though. Eugene was a true legendary magician. Fighting face to face wasn't his strong point, but if Eugene chose to stay in the shadows and plotted, that would be truly horrible. After composing himself behind the stalagmite, Link walked to Eugene's corpse. After looking around, he found an extraordinary dark wand and some magic items. This included a spatial ring. Opening the ring, Link couldn't help but shake his head. So many good things as expected of an old legendary magician. Collecting all of them, Link checked his own state. That attack had seemed fast, but it had cost a lot too. In that instant, he'd used up more than 5,000 realm essence points. This was close to 30% of his total power. I still have more than 70%, and I should only have the light magician left. I can deal with him. Link continued on with that in mind. He walked for more than ten minutes along the tunnel. Then he suddenly saw someone leaning against a huge stalagmite up ahead. Looking, his heart jumped. It was none other than the Red Dragon Queen Gretel. She transformed back into human form and was covered in blood. A crystal spear that kept flashing with golden lightning was in her waist. Her head rested weakly against the stalagmite. Her fiery hair fell messily around her. Behind her, the pool of blood had flowed for more than three feet. The view was tragic. Perhaps due to a dragon's strong vitality, Gretel hadn't died. Her chest was still rising slightly. Hearing the footsteps, she opened her eyes and saw Link. That moment, she smiled bitterly. She opened her mouth to say something but didn't in the end. She just sighed and closed her eyes again. She knew that this human wasn't the human she'd imagined. He was a lord. Perhaps he looked warm on the outside, but inside, he was fierce, cold, and cruel. 
They may have been friends, but they had different paths. He wouldn't help her. Though her logical mind told her this, Gretel still had some hope in her heart. Tap, tap, tap. The footsteps got closer. They were about to reach her. Gretel couldn't help but open her eyes. But what she saw dashed all hope. Link didn't seem to see her. He acted as if she was a cold corpse and walked past without even turning his head. I was right, but that's all right. I have nothing to miss in life. Gretel's heart had given up. The lightning spear had destroyed her body. All she could do now was wait for death. Tap, tap, tap. Link's footsteps faded into the distance. A teardrop rolled down from Gretel's closed eyes. This was the second time she'd shed tears for Link. It would be the last time too. Forward slash. This is a 7 English podcast and you're listening to Advent of the Archmage. But then something happened. Link's voice suddenly sounded. Helino, I see you. Come out. This is a 7 English podcast and you're listening to Advent of the Archmage. Chapter 598. Only one will walk out of here alive. There was a slight breeze blowing through the path between the ice walls. The breeze dispersed the white mist floating across the path as it blew towards Link. A lone figure appeared from the mist. The man was wearing a flowing gray-white robe. His hair and beard were also a pristine white. It was Helino. He was holding a crystal magic wand in his right hand and a stone tablet which shone with an erratic light in his left hand. It was the fragment of the Book of Creation which had appeared on the platform at the ice cap of the mountain back then. He had managed to retrieve it before anyone else. I didn't think you would be able to make quick work of Eugene, said Helino in a low voice. So you two formed an alliance? Link lightly placed a hand on the handle of the Ode of the Full Moon Sword, ready to strike out at the first opportunity. Helino had the same idea as well. His power pulsated at the crystal tip of his magic wand, ready to conjure magical constructs around him at the first sign of trouble. At that moment, both Helino and Link remained wary of each other. Neither one of them dared make the first move while the opportunity had yet to present itself to them. It wasn't an alliance exactly, just an agreement that had benefited both sides under the current circumstances. I handle Gretel, Eugene handles you. Once I have the fragment, I'll fight it out with him. I've figured out what the Guardian has in mind for all of us. Only one of us will walk out of this valley alive. There's no point in reaching the fragment first while someone else is still alive. Saying this, Helino threw the glowing fragment to the ground. I'll just put this here. Now let us battle. Whoever wins will have it. Link chuckled coldly. That sounds nice and all, but why would you pick this place as our battleground? Why didn't you just kill Gretel immediately? Is leaving her barely alive your way of trying to distract me? Helino smiled faintly. Eugene was clearly outmatched by you. There's little to no difference in power level between me and him. Our methods are also the same. Our duels have always ended in a stalemate for years, so there's no way to tell who's stronger. I knew I needed to resort to less conventional means to defeat you. For the sake of all of Firemen, I will not let the High Elves destroy this world. I need the tablet, and this is the only way to make sure that I have it in the end. His words sounded righteous and filled with a sense of justice. Link could not find the words to rebuke him. He would have done the same thing if he was in Helino's shoes. To a true magician, the ends always justified the means. For example, in order to further his own nefarious goals, a notorious dark magician like Eugene did not shy away from staining his hands with the blood of hundreds of thousands of lives. Link too had the blood of thousands on his hands. In order to aid Orita Fortress resistance against the Dark Army, he had conceived the Sunlight Seed through experiments using live subjects. Ordinary magicians might not be able to stomach his actions, but legendary magicians like Helena would have understood why he had to do the things he did. Link took a long breath. Well, it worked. I was indeed worried about Gretel's well-being. You were able to throw me off balance by torturing her. Link's feelings for Gretel were complicated. They used to be close friends with something of a history behind them. Though their paths had split, Link's heart was still haunted by Gretel's shadow. He would never want her to die, not in front of him anyway. More importantly, 
As the queen of the dragon race, she was more useful to Link and Ferd alive. The red dragon queen might have been stubborn and old-fashioned, but she was also a reliable person. Her personality was a constant. You never needed to guess when she would turn on you. Having her by your side was a boon in itself. The dragon race was also incredibly powerful. Whenever something or someone threatened to throw the world out of balance, the dragon race would rise up as self-proclaimed peacekeepers to tip the world back into balance. Right now, the High Elves planned on merging the two realms. This would have far-reaching effects on the world. Though Helino and the others had been working desperately to stop the High Elves, things might not work in their favor. As a lord, Link needed to devise a series of countermeasures for all possible contingencies. If they were unable to stop the realm reunification, the world would descend into chaos. The High Elves would be a common enemy shared by all other races and firemen, and the dragons would naturally become allies of Ferd as a result. Evidently, a dragon race with the stabilizing presence of the Dragon Queen was a hundred times better than one without her. Whatever the case might be, Link needed Gretel alive. Helino was surprised to hear Link's words. You actually told me what your weakness is. You should know that I could send my spear of light flying through Gretel with a mere thought. So it would seem, said Link, nodding in acknowledgement. He then continued. However, this will leave you completely unguarded. You'll be risking your own life just to end hers. If Helino were to be distracted for even a hundredth of a second, Link would not hesitate to kill him as he had killed Eugene. Helino glared at Link. This human stood quietly before him, his black battle robe billowing around him. He looked more like a hardened warrior than a magician with that magic sword he was holding in his hand. The human before Helino gave him the impression of a volcano that was about to erupt at any moment. Though Link looked serene on the outside, Helino could feel that he would not be able to survive this volcano's eruption. After standing in front of each other for half a minute, Helino began to sense his sense of inferiority growing in him. Realizing this, he sighed. I'll admit, you may be the strongest battle mage in all of firemen I've ever seen. In one-on-one -on -one combat, your magic is the equivalent of an unstoppable tank. But it does not mean that I have no chance of beating you, Lord of Ferd. Unencumbered, no one is your equal. However, that is not the case right now. If I leave you now, you'll be able to take the fragment from and save Gretel as well. However, you will be at your weakest when you're burdened by both an injured person and an invaluable stone tablet. Saying this, Helino began to step back slowly until his body slipped into the white mist behind him. A faint voice echoed out from it. So choose wisely, Lord of Ferd. There was a sudden bang beside Link. The spear of light embedded in Gretel's body exploded into specks of light. The explosion managed to widen Gretel's wound even more, causing her extreme pain. However, it was not powerful enough to kill her immediately. Arg! Gretel shrieked out in pain. Her entire body then collapsed on the ground. Blood flowed out of the gaping wound between her chest and abdomen in rivulets. If Link did not cast a healing spell to stop the bleeding soon, the Red Dragon Queen would most certainly die before him. Link turned around and was about to do something about the Red Dragon Queen's wound when suddenly he stopped. In an instant, he drew his sword out and stabbed it out to his side. A despair ball appeared before the sword tip, swallowing half of the sword as it extended outward. In one fluid motion, Link had lashed out just as quickly as when he had delivered the final blow to Eugene. A soft groan echoed from the white mist. It was the light magician Helino. Link's ode of the full moon sword had pierced his heart. From the sword, realm essence power flowed into Helino's body like a moonlit stream. Gradually, a ball of destruction began to form in his heart. The ball of destruction did not explode immediately in him, which was the reason why Helino was still alive. Helino grasped at his chest in pain. From a few hundred feet away, he asked, How did you know I was about to attack? Link pointed a finger at Gretel and cast a spatial sealing spell on her, sealing her body in a spatial bubble. He then slowly said, On the Golden Plains, if a beastman wished to become a warlord, he would be required to overcome a series of challenges. Once a beastman declared his candidacy for the title of warlord, one of the trials he would be required to take on was to survive a series of assassination attempts. Powerful assassins would try to kill him at every opportunity for a whole month, day and night. 
he would only be deemed fit to bear the title of warlord after having survived this trial. The candidate could employ whatever means necessary to overcome this trial. If the new warlord was not able to stay alert even in his sleep, this meant that he sorely lacked training and would probably have to stay up all night for a whole month on a lookout for assassins. He would probably die from the exhaustion if no assassin had managed to kill him at that point. The only way any potential warlord candidate could get through this trial was the legendary battle technique, the Soul Furnace. The perfect unification of soul, strength, and body would naturally sharpen one's sensitivity to all forms of danger, allowing it to surpass even a wild beast's instincts. A beastman warlord who had mastered the Soul Furnace technique would be able to sense an enemy's presence even in his sleep. He would be ambush-proof. This was the true strength of the beastman's Soul Furnace technique. Helino might not have lost to Link so easily if he had put up a fair fight. It was a shame that he had chosen to fight so dishonorably. When Link turned around, Helino thought that this was his chance to move in. However, it was then that he took a hit from Link's sword. In a fight between two equally powerful masters, whoever slipped up first would be instantly killed by the other. This was the cruel reality of any life and death battle. Link then cast a soul barrier around Helino's body preventing his soul from escaping. Eugene's soul was more than enough for Link. He wondered if he needed to keep another enemy's soul. Helino instantly knew what Link was up to. Panicking, he shouted, I'm not like Eugene. He's a banished dark magician. His soul will wander around the mortal plane if it's let loose. My soul, however, will ascend to the God of Light's kingdom. You're right, but I won't make the same mistake twice. Even if you'll be ascending to heaven, that's not your call to make. It's mine. At that moment, the ball of destruction exploded inside Helino's body, blowing it up into pieces. The soul barrier that Link had set up immediately shrank around the explosion until a single soul crystal was all that was left of Helino. Link beckoned at the soul crystal, and it flew into Link's hand. Don't worry, your soul isn't of much use to me anyway. I'll be sure to personally take it to a church of light and let an archbishop send you to heaven. Keeping the crystal away, Link walked towards where the Book of Creation's fragment lay. He had defeated everyone. The fragment was his to keep. However, as he reached for the fragment, there was a glimmer of light from it. The Guardian's image appeared on the tablet. He looked at Link and pointed at the Red Dragon Queen. Young man, you still haven't dealt with everyone. She's still alive. He said, This is a seven English podcast and you're listening to Advent of the Archmage. Chapter 599 Young Man, Wish You a Beautiful Life The protector's words made Link stop. He glanced at Gretel. She was frozen in the spatial seal. A bloody gaping hole practically went straight through her. Her entire body was covered in blood. Flesh lay on the ground around her. Her frozen eyes were opened listlessly. Her pupils had started expanding, but her head was raised slightly. Her gaze was directed at Link's current position. Her expression was complicated. There was some happiness but also bitterness. No one could pinpoint her thoughts. Something was clear though. If Link removed the spatial seal and didn't receive any help, she would die within a few minutes. She doesn't have any power to fight back. Link didn't want to do it. She doesn't now but you won't let her die. You have enough power to save her. As long as she's alive, she will try to destroy the Book of Creation Peace. She will be your opponent. So if you let her live, you won't be able to get the peace. The Protector's words were heartless. He'd given Link a very cruel choice. He could either choose the Book of Creation or choose to save Gretel. He could only choose one. Judging from the performance earlier, the protector was abnormally strong, reaching level 19. Link had no confidence to break through the obstacles set by something like that. People can change. She might not be that insistent. Link tried to persuade the protector. The protector shook his head. It seems that you don't know her well enough. Can you easily persuade a dragon queen who has lived for more than 2,000 years and seen all the horrors of life? No, you can't. No one can change what she's already decided. You can't either, young man. He emphasized the last two words, pointing out Link's age. He wasn't wrong. 
Link may possess great power now and experience more than most humans, but he was still in his twenties. Even if he added his days from both worlds, he wouldn't be older than fifty. His experiences and knowledge couldn't help him understand someone that had existed for two thousand years. It was like how an innocent child couldn't understand an adult. They could live under the same roof but weren't living at the same level at all. This was a fact. Link couldn't refute it. Seeing that Link admitted it, the protector continued. The book of creation contains unlimited power. Once you have it, you'll stand at the peak of firemen and become the ultimate sovereign. At the peak, there is freezing wind. Countless people will have their eyes on your power, trying to steal your glory. Your closest friends will stab a dagger into your heart. Your most trusted will give you poison wine. Your lover will become the one who ends you. If the sovereign wishes to remain for eternity, you must be lonely. So, end her life. The protector's words were magical. When he spoke, different images appeared in Link's mind uncontrollably. In the images, Iliard stared at him from a dark corner with hatred. When he was sleeping, Celine's hands gripped around a poisoned dagger. The reports Lucy gave him were all faked. They were images of all his friends betraying him. Other images appeared too. They weren't about him anymore. Instead, they were historical events from Fireman and Earth that he'd read before. In these images, the kings and emperors were all alone. To get the throne, fathers killed sons, brothers killed each other, and mothers killed sons. There were endless tragedies and unspeakable darkness. Whoosh, whoosh. Cold wind sounded in Link's ears. He thought back to the protector's words. If a sovereign wishes to remain for eternity, you must be lonely. At the peak, there is freezing wind. Yes, the wind was too bone-chilling. They were only hallucinations, but even with his strong mind, Link still shuddered subconsciously. The protector's shadow had a pair of glowing eyes. Those eyes seemed to see through everything. Looking at Link, he could see his soul. Young man, what is your choice? Lonely glory or a mortal's happiness? Link looked at the bloodied and dying Gretel again. After a pause, he said, I choose. To be honest, he didn't know what to choose. This was the first time he felt lost after coming to this world. Before he could finish, his vision flashed quickly. He glanced and saw the mission from earlier, the peace that shouldn't exist. The mission flashed with blinding red light. It wasn't just to show its existence, but also to remind Link that the God of Light wanted him to destroy it. At the same time, the sword spirit's voice rang in his mind again. Another voice appeared in my mind. It said one sentence, all existences in the world have hearts. If one's heart is blinded, the world will have no light. The sentence was mysterious. After hearing it, Link's heart twitched. Something flashed past his mind. It was fleeting, like a rabbit sprinting in the grass, but he could see the blurry figure. Experience told Link that if he couldn't decide, then he shouldn't get affected by the outside world and decide brashly. He should think carefully to prevent making an irrevocable mistake. Thus, he shut his mouth and fell silent again. What is your choice, young man? The protector urged. Link shook his head. I haven't decided. You've already waited for so long. You can wait a bit longer, right? Indeed, I will wait for your decision. Link thought back to the sword spirit's words. He composed himself and carefully sensed his surroundings. More than ten minutes later, a light flashed in Link's mind. He had a hypothesis. Nothing is restricting my power recovery, and the space isn't sealed. I can still use spatial magic. Does that mean that the restrictions on transmissions and flight aren't real? Thinking of that, Link ignored the protector and took out the ode of the full moon. He started practicing the soul furnace battle technique. He went through each move slowly. His thoughts were sinking too. After a long while, Link's heart suddenly jumped. There was something abnormal. It was in his soul rather than the environment. With the help of the soul furnace, Link was able to focus completely. His soul entered an indescribably calm state. It was as smooth and flat as the surface of a mirror. Right now, Link's heart had no disturbances. He didn't have any emotions. He was completely calm. There were many reasons why he could reach this state. 
Firstly, there was the Soul Furnace, a legendary battle technique. Secondly, Link had the pure Realm Essence. It was abnormally perfect and basically gave Link zero disturbances. More importantly, Link had high control over his soul. In this calm, Link could sense the tiniest shred of abnormalities. Now, he could feel several strange thoughts in his soul. After sensing carefully, he found three. Two were clear. The first was that he couldn't use transmission spells while getting to the peace. The second was that he couldn't fly in the valley. These were the requirements given by the protector. Another thought was blurry. Link sensed it carefully and discovered it was very fuzzy evil intent. It came from the protector. It was hard to explain, but it activated Link's stress mechanism. After this was activated, the changes in his soul influenced his entire body which affected his power. After this avalanche-like chain effect, Link's body thought that everything in the environment was harmful and subconsciously rejected absorbing the power. All existences in the world have hearts. If one's heart is blinded, the world will have no light. The sword spirit's voice rang in Link's mind again. This time, it dawned on him. A ray of sunlight appeared in his clouded soul. Once the light appeared, it sliced apart the clouds like a sharp sword. The world in Link's eyes brightened too. At the same time, he discovered that the looming ice walls had changed too. They looked cloudy, like a white mist. It suddenly dawned on Link. The protector's illusion wasn't actually that powerful. Most of his tricks were on the aspect of one's soul. Most of his surroundings weren't real. Other than the outermost walls of this icy valley, everything was fake. Exhaling, Link looked back at the protector's figure. He realized it was an illusion too. Looking closely, he saw that the air around it was wavering. Its power was actually quite weak. It was practically just air. You're just the remnant of an ancient lord's consciousness. Now you can no longer stop me. With that, Link walked towards the Book of Creation piece and picked it up. During this, the protector retreated automatically. He smiled faintly. When Link picked up the piece, he bowed slightly. Young man, you passed the final test. Link no longer had any doubts. Looking at the piece in his hands, he said, It won't turn me into the ruler or even give me any power, right? Of course. It's just a broken piece. If it really could turn someone into the sovereign, it wouldn't be abandoned here. Then why was it passed down through the millenniums? Link asked. It is a key. Light appeared in the protector's hands. When it dissipated, all illusions in the ice valley disappeared. The freezing wind, icy snow, and extreme frigidity appeared one by one, showing the true appearance of the extreme north. Whoosh, whoosh. Freezing wind blew endlessly, scraping Link's face like knives. He was forced to cast a level 5 spell to fight against the cold. The protector's illusion wavered in the wind and snow. He pointed at the tall mountain behind him. Do you see the mountain path covered by thick snow? Link looked. Through the heavy snow, he saw a mountain behind the protector. A path snaked across it, but it was covered with snow. If not for the fact that the snow piles were very smooth, he wouldn't be able to see the path at all. Follow the path up. At the peak, there is a cave with a level 19 eternal seal. The key is in your hands. Young man, I wish you a beautiful life. After that sentence, wind blew and the protector transformed into snow, melting into the tundra. Link glanced at the corner again. The game system's mission was still there, but it didn't flash anymore. The blood-red color had turned gray too. Behind it, it said, Discarded. This surprised Link slightly. The God of Light can be wrong too? He'd always thought that the God of Light was very powerful and knew practically everything about firemen. Apparently, he was wrong. Thinking back, this wasn't the God of Light's first mistake. Back at the Abba City, he'd been fooled by the God of Destruction. It seems that the God of Light isn't as powerful as I thought. He can't control level 19 strength in the mortal world. This detail helped Link see the God of Light's bottom line. He was powerful but not impossibly so. He had many flaws in his control of firemen. Of course, Link was still too weak. It was too soon to think of this. Shaking his head, he tossed the thoughts to the back of his head. 
activating a levitation spell and void walk, he followed the mountain path to the peak. Seconds later, Link was before a ten-foot-tall ice crystal. At a glance, it was just a normal block of ice. At closer inspection, Link saw that it was covered in runes. They were innumerable and complicated. He felt like his head would crack apart at just a glance, so he gave up. When he walked up to it, the piece in his hand brightened and buzzed. It started shaking, almost leaving his hands. Link let go, and it immediately floated to the crystal door. Then, like water fusing into a river, it disappeared. A few seconds later, the crystal door shone too. Five seconds later, there was a soft poof, and the door disappeared. A tiny hidden chamber appeared. Pale blue light came from it, as well as a lovely and ethereal sound. Link walked in, and his eyes widened. He saw two people inside the room. No, more correctly, it was two dried corpses. This is a seven English podcast, and you're listening to Advent of the Archmage. Chapter 600 Book of Revelation, Rosso's Book of Spirits, One Half The interior of the ice cave looked like an ordinary living room. It was approximately 100 square feet wide. There were two semicircular bookshelves hanging on the walls. In a corner of the room, there was a smaller room with an embroidered screen blocking its entrance. Through the screen, one could see a large bed in it. This must be the bedroom. In the main room, there was a large circular table. Beside the table sat the bodies of a man and a woman. Their corpses were still intact, despite the fact that they had been desiccated thoroughly and now looked like a pair of withered branches. The expressions on their faces remained the same as when they were still alive. The man was reading a magic book, while the woman was busy carving a golden bird figurine. Their faces were serene. The man even seemed to be talking. There was a magic book which emitted a faint blue glow in the middle of the circular table. The empty sound that Link had heard just then was coming from it. UP. Dated by. This is a 7 English podcast and you're listening to Advent of the Archmage. Lots of questions now popped up in Link's mind. Who are these people? Why did they come to live here in the far north? And why did they leave this magic book behind? Prompted by a desire to resolve these questions, Link began walking into the room of ice. No sooner had he taken his third step than a subtle current of magical power suddenly filled the air. Stunned, Link stopped. His hand instinctively flew to the ode of a full moon sword's handle. Two seconds later, a silhouette appeared in front of him. The silhouette swirled about in the room before coming to rest on the two corpses. Strangely enough, when the silhouette wrapped itself around them, the two withered bodies began to swell up. Link could see that their skins was gradually regaining moisture, while their glassy eyes cleared considerably, as if the two bodies had been brought back from the dead. A drastic change swept across the entire room as well. Everything in the room, which was initially covered by a layer of dust, now shone with almost surreal cleanliness. However, Link knew that this was all just an illusion. In truth, the bodies still remained lifeless. The magical power that Link felt just then had simply refracted the light in such a way that the bodies only seemed to have come back alive. A moment later, the man started speaking. Lucia, my life's coming to an end soon. The man's eyes did not leave the magic book he was holding as he said this. His face remained expressionless, as if his death was about as unusual as a neighbor coming by to borrow a cup of sugar. The woman beside him laughed, not at all perturbed by what the man said. She did not stop carving the golden bird figurine. I see. I guess we'll need to start making arrangements for that now, won't we? The man nodded. He stood up, walked to one of the bookcases and then took out a magic book. Link peeked at it and saw that the book the man was holding was similar to the one on the table, at least on the outside. The only difference was that it was not glowing, nor was it making any peculiar sound. The man returned to his seat with the book and then placed it in the middle of the table. Link noticed that there was a simple-looking magical rune etched in the middle of the table. When the magic book was placed on it, the runes on the rest of the table began to glow. Light then began flowing from the rune formation into the magic book. Link also realized that the light did not actually come from the rune formation itself. It was flowing out from the man's hand. The magic book grew brighter and brighter as it absorbed more and more of the light. 
It then began to emit an empty, trembling sound. The man was shriveling up visibly. He now looked to be 100 years old when he finally stopped pouring the light into the book. Dear, we can live for close to a thousand years with this power if we want to. Will you be angry at me for doing this? Said the man ruefully to the woman sitting beside him. No, Rosso, there's always a beginning and an end to all life. We've completed our respective journeys in life. Another thousand years would only be torment for our souls. Said the woman, shaking her head. Link noticed that for some reason, the woman's face had withered like the man as well. This couple must have used some kind of spell to bind their life forces together, thought Link. Just then, the man, who was still barely alive, took out a pencil and began writing slowly on the magic book before him. The woman, not at all concerned about death's approach, continued carving the golden bird figurine. The man began reading what he was writing. I am Rosso Schneider. I started studying magic when I was 28 years old. However, the first three years of my studies had been uneventful. When I was 31 years old, I stumbled across a soul stone. For whatever reason, it chose me, granting me an incredible potential for the mystic arts. Ten years later, I was given the honorable title of Soul Dominator. Another ten years later, I began studying prophecy magic for five years, but without any noticeable progress. One night, when I was looking at the stars, I had a sudden epiphany. At that moment, I realized that one needs to receive the realm's blessing in order to master prophecy magic. No amount of rigorous training was going to help me accomplish that. The man was writing his life story in the book. Link patiently listened in a corner, curious as to how the man's story ended. Ten minutes later, the man stopped writing. He gave a sideways look at the magic book that was emitting a faint blue glow for three seconds. His eyes then returned to the book in front of him. After looking at it for ten seconds, he resumed his writing. The gift of clairvoyance had allowed me to see what the future holds. It was both a blessing and the most terrifying curse one could hope to receive in this realm. I had lost all hope in life. In order to recover the hope I had lost, I had struggled upstream against the river of time, peering into the future until at last, I saw a turning point, 120,000 years into the future. 120,000 years later, the realm's timeline had diverged into multiple branches. It was like a tree that had begun to branch out, creating multitudes of possible futures. Some of these futures I had seen were bleak, some even completely annihilated. However, there were also some filled with light and hope. The possibilities were endless. 120,000 years was too long a time. Even if I ascended to godhood, I would not be able to live that long to see which future unfolded. I have seen my end. I have received the realm's blessing, and then I will fade from this world as quietly as I had entered it. And so, I have decided to leave the book of spirits behind for posterity. The man finally put down his pencil. He lifted his head up and looked at Link. He then spoke, his eyes seemingly focused on nothing in particular. To the future possessors of this book, your identities are legion. Demons, beast men, servants of the god of destruction, elves, or even humans. Whoever you may be, the fact that you have come this far means that you have passed the guardian's test. You now have the right to possess this book. Take it. Finally, the wisdom I have accumulated for a lifetime has an air. When the man finished speaking, the silhouette vanished. Everything was back to normal. Only the magic book remained humming on the table as if waiting for Link to pick it up. Link was not in a rush to pick up the prophet's book. He stood in the entrance and bowed low before the bodies of the two ancient sages. Only then did he walk forward and pick the book of spirits up from the table. As soon as the book of spirits left the table, the room began to sway gently. Cracks appeared on the table, the withered corpses, the bookshelves, and even the small bedroom. They began to crumble, bit by bit. In the blink of an eye, the whole room of ice collapsed into a pile of ash. Only the magic book that Link was holding in his hand remained unscathed. The surrounding walls in the ice cave also began to crack, threatening to collapse all around him. At that moment, Link cast a spell to keep the walls intact as long as he could. The sword spirit's voice sounded in Link's head. He's the sole dominator. He was the most powerful entity to ever exist in ancient times. He was the ancestor of Selene Flandra as well as a good friend of the Storm Lord. 
He had even tried telling the Storm Lord to keep his temper in check, or there would be consequences. However, his words fell on deaf ears. Soon, the Soul Dominator stopped telling his friend off, which ultimately led to Storm Lord's downfall. Link was moved by the Sword Spirit's tale. He recalled Rosso's life story and vividly felt the hopelessness that the Prophet had felt due to being submerged in visions of possible futures. Link could only imagine what it must have felt like to bear such a curse throughout one's life. He bowed again at the Soul Dominator's body before leaving the room. As he stepped out, the room lost the support of Link's spell and instantly came crashing down. Outside the cave, the Book of Spirits in Link's hand stopped glowing. Link tried to put the magic book inside his spatial ring but failed. The book seemed to be resistant to spatial magic. The book's cover was made of a leather specially forged through alchemy. Link decided to simply bind the book securely to his waist. Suddenly, there was a flash of light in his vision. The game system had brought up some information regarding the magic book Link had just gotten. Player has received the magic book titled Rosso's Book of Spirits. Book of Revelation, Rosso's Book of Spirits. Level 19 Flawless Divine Gear. Special Effect 1. Contains all the magical wisdom Rosso has accumulated in his lifetime. UP dated by. This is a 7 English podcast and you're listening to Advent of the Archmage. Special Effect 2. The caster will be able to activate the level 19 prophecy spell, Divination of the Fates, by channeling enough power into the book. This spell allows the caster to divine the fates of everything that exists in the Fireman realm. Higher level targets will require more magical power. This spell can be cast on any target, regardless of its level. Cooldown time, one year. Note, this world holds no secret from me. Reading the message, Link let out a sigh, before saying, Such a terrifying spell. I guess that's to be expected from a level 19 master. Composing himself, Link headed towards the bottom of the ice mountain. Gretel was still frozen in stasis by his spatial spell. Her injuries were grave. Patching her up under these circumstances would be a difficult task, even for Link. What should I do? Said Link as he began thinking of ways to treat Gretel's injuries. Please subscribe to A7 English Podcasts and enjoy listening every day with us. Thank you.